Welcome to Better Health for a Better World, a dedicated podcast series that shines a spotlight on global health projects and programs supported by the Government of Ireland across partner countries in the Global South. I'm your host, Nadine Ferris France, and together we'll embark on a journey to explore the remarkable initiatives transforming lives and communities around the globe. This podcast aligns with Ireland's international policy document, A Better World, which serves as a framework for our discussions. Each episode will feature interviews with one or two speakers who are at the forefront of implementation. Get ready to be inspired by the incredible change makers working tirelessly to build a healthier and more equitable world. In this episode of Better Health for a Better World, we explore the critical intersection of health and climate change with a focus on Kenya. We'll look at the rationale and the impact of Irish Aid support in Kenya as we learn about local efforts to build sustainable food systems and climate smart agricultural practices, as well as promote gender equality and protect vulnerable communities. Our guests will discuss the links between climate change and issues such as hunger, disease, conflict and displacement, and they'll also highlight the importance of investing in women and gender equality to overcome these issues and improve health outcomes. Today, we welcome three guests to the series. Ambassador Fanula Quinlan, who is the Ambassador of Ireland to Kenya, Sudan, Somalia and Eritrea. Dr. Edwin Mbogwa, Health and Nutrition Coordinator with NGO Concern Worldwide. And Samson Wasilwa, Program Officer with the NGO International Alert. So welcome to you all and perhaps Ambassador Quinlan, I'd like to come to you first um, and just start by asking you, could you share some background and history on Ireland's partnership with Kenya? Of course, and I'm delighted to join you today, Nadine, and to be joined also by some of our key partners, of course, Concern and indeed International Alert. So Ireland has had quite a long partnership with Kenya and it dates back much further actually than than, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs. Fair's involvement officially, it dates back really to the pivotal role that Irish missionaries have played here. And then leading from the Irish missionaries, of course, some of our our world-class NGOs. Um, So missionaries are really well known in Kenya, for particularly for their work in health and in education. And very often in my role, I meet very senior, you know, very senior Kenyans, Kenyan leaders. And that's one of the first things they they talk to me about, their, their familiarity with Ireland, their affection for Ireland often about my accent, the Irish accent, and just their fondness for it as a result of their very positive experience um, with Irish missionaries. And now, of course, you know, we have the huge contribution of NGOs such as Trokra, Brighter Communities, Concern, and many others to Kenya over that time. So we did have a mission, we did have an embassy in Kenya um, for some time uh, up to the 80s, and regrettably for just financial reasons that had to be closed. But the embassy, the government took a decision to reopen the embassy in 2014. Um, and that really allowed us to build on, on the partnerships that I've spoken to you about already and to, to work with Kenya very substantively on a number of key issues. I mean, first and foremost, Ireland and Kenya kind of from, um, I guess, a foreign policy perspective, we've worked very closely together, co-negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, an absolutely landmark um, international agreement. And of course, I'm looking behind you there, Nadine, and seeing the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so Ireland and Kenya played a key role in bringing those to fruition. We shared a term on the UN Security Council most recently. That was in um, 2021 and 2022. And really, we worked very closely together on just the importance of multilateralism, climate and security, of course, which is relevant to our conversation today, and the very critical role that women play in peace building. Um, and Ireland, of course, throughout our campaign and throughout our tenure on the Security Council, was really a very strong advocate for having strong African voices in on the UNSC as well in the Security Council. So we work together very effectively there. Um, of course, we have, you know, we have a lot of, we have quite a bit of trade. There's an Irish community here in Kenya. There is the Kenya Irish Society. There's Business Ireland Kenya, which is, is devoted to building trade links. But Ireland's also supporting Kenya, both from a development and humanitarian perspective. Um, we, you know, we're very keen to share the lessons of our development with Kenya, and now a lower middle income country, you know, the biggest market in East Africa, poised really for a lot of um, foreign direct investment. 
but also obviously coming out of, you know, a sometimes troubled uh, and difficult past, as indeed Ireland did as well. So we've worked with them on to share some of our les- lessons on going from being, you know, uh, kind of an underdeveloped agricultural nation, I guess, as we would have been many years ago, to now obviously where, you know, we're, we're a major food exporter. So we're working with Kenya on agriculture. We're working with Kenya on um education in science, technology and maths. And that's uh, Young Scientist Kenya, which is modeled very, very closely on the BT Young Scientists. We're also working with Kenya trying to share some of our lessons and learning around gender equality and the importance of gender equality um, and also doing, doing some, so having some support to governance. And again, that's very much focused on women's political participation. And then, of course, and we can talk about this a little bit more, the drought, the devastating drought that has affected Kenya and the Horn of Africa and um, we had a visit from our Minister for Overseas Development in 2022, one of five visits by a minister, by an Irish minister to Kenya in the last five years. Um, and as a result of that, you know, and as a result of that visit and as a result of the severity of the situation here, Ireland's been investing significantly over 100 million in the Horn of Africa um, to support to support these communities who are, who are in desperate need. But maybe I'll, I'll leave it there, and, but I'm very happy to take other questions. Yeah, thank you so much. It's such a it's such a vast portfolio, you know. Just uh, the the issues that you mention and the um, the areas of focus, um, it just just presents such a an incredible um, array of 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 the issues that need to be tackled around health and development and education. Um, and perhaps you know, as you're talking about some of the issues there around uh, climate change and health. You know, you've mentioned some of them already, but from your perspective, what are some of those major challenges um, that Kenya and the, the the greater region is is facing? And I suppose, in particular, how can Ireland, you know, such a small nation in a in a big pond, um, how can Ireland, uh, you know, play a role in partnering with organisations in in Kenya to address those challenges? Well, I think first and foremost, given the given just the severity of the drought, and of course this drought, Kenya is now facing into a, a sixth failed rainy season. Although the forecasts, happily, there has been there has been some there have been some rains, but still the situation is really quite dire here. Of course, in Somalia, in um, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and of course this, there is serious conflict now and real need in, in Sudan as well. Of course. But I guess first and foremost, Ireland has focused on um, providing humanitarian funding. So um, alone, just to Kenya in 2022, our funding has been has come to 11 over 11 million, and that's in both development and humanitarian funding. But as I said, to the Horn as a whole, that's over 100 million. So of course, first and foremost, that's really on on life saving, you know, interventions to support the the needs of a community that are really really balanced on a knife edge, many of them, because of course we've six or the, we're facing into the sixth failed rainy season. But prior to that, we've also had COVID-19, you know, a devastating desert locust attack. We're now seeing the impact, you know, inflation of around 8%, partly at least as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine um, and climate. I mean, Kenya is without a doubt one of the most climate uh, vulnerable countries in the world. And that is notwithstanding the fact that they are a leader in renewables, producing more than 90% of their energy from renewable sources. And um, I mean, there's there's been figures put on the on the scale of the losses here in terms of just the, you know, the the devastating over two billion livestock lost, um, millions of women, girls, men. In grave need. I mean, I mentioned earlier a visit by minister, by former minister of state uh, for overseas development, Colin Brophy. When he came here in um, in August 2022, we went up to uh, Turkana, which is in the arid northeast, and we actually went very far north. And just the you know the communities that we met, they were talking to us about how first they'd lost their livestock, then they'd lost their crops. And now they were afraid they were going to lose their children. I mean, it was devastating and it was very evident from looking, you know, just from looking around and from hearing their stories, the great, the huge scale of need. So I was very proud, actually, that when when the minister came back and obviously he he spoke at length and advocated very strongly and the Irish government took a decision to allocate an additional 30 million to the Horn of Africa in 2022. So that was to, just towards the end of last year. But I mean, I think we've also been throughout our time very clear, you know, that the, of the links between hunger and climate and between conflict and climate. And, you know, for example, our support to International Alert is around, uh, and I'm sure uh, my, our colleague from International Alert will speak to that in just a moment, but, you know, around supporting communities 
to um, negotiate with each other to overcome the you know the the, the potential conflict issues around uh, that climate can can pose. But of course, when you've when you've millions of people who are suffering from chronic malnutrition, the impact on health is very very clear. And you know we were in. Uh, feeding centers where children, you know, very vulnerable children were getting, you know, emergency, emergency food supplies. But, you know, we, we're always conscious, of course, that those are the lucky ones as well. So I think coming back, you know, longer term, our investment in women, our investment in gender equality is is a key um, issue for Ireland. Because, of course, we know women are at the center of their families, they're at the center of their communities. Like all the research shows that investing in women, is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Because they do, you know, that investment then pays dividends in terms of family nutrition and children's education and so forth. So, um, so we're very committed to it, of course, to gender equality is one of the priorities that Irish Aid has identified, along with reducing humanitarian need. And, and both of those are very pertinent in this part of the world. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. And you're just mentioning some of the, I know there, you know, the better, a better world, which is um, the policy document of, of Irish aid, which guides a lot of the responses. And I think, you know, you mentioned gender equality, governance is a, is a big one. Um, how, you know, how, how is Ireland implementing just, just lastly and, and briefly, if you, if you might, how is Ireland implementing that international development policy? Thank you so much. Well, I mean, look, a key tenet of our development cooperation here, and I mentioned it, is around agriculture, because we know that in Kenya, approximately 60% of the population are employed in agriculture. You know, it accounts for around a third of GDP. So, of course, if you can make a difference there, it really is, you know, it can, it can, make, a, it can make a real systemic change. So, we're working in, our, in, in Kenya on sustainable food systems, climate smart agricultural practices, gender equality and enhancing the enabling environment for the private sector and trade. Um, our, our, development, our bilateral co- development program in Kenya is just under 2 million in 2023, but it is around strengthening the potato and the dairy chains. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we're leveraging Ireland's very strong experience here. So we have Chagas, Ireland's, um, Ireland's extension service and Ireland's research and development arm working with their Kenyan counterpart to um, to try to develop climate smart agricultural um, practices and also to strengthen the potato and dairy chains, as I mentioned, and essentially improve the livelihoods of smallholder farmers and with a particular focus on, on women. Gender equality and the empowerment of girls, we said, of course, that is a priority of, of uh, Irish aid and, and our policy, a better world. And indeed, we see that reflected in our in our program here in terms of whether we're working on Young Scientist Kenya, we're trying to ensure that girls... Um, and young women are getting a you know a very good and fair shot at um at, at accessing those programs, and then also of course on agriculture and in terms of women's political participation, we've been working to ensure that women um both can participate safely in elections, vote safely, and um and and measures to reduce gender based violence during elections. So and you know the the 2022 elections. They passed off relatively peacefully, of course, you know, not 100 percent, but relatively peacefully. And uh, we were very glad to see that reports from all of our partners suggesting that the incidents of gender based violence in particular were reduced over previous years. Um, And then I mentioned, you know, a lot of a lot of work going on in, in the humanitarian sphere as well in terms of responding to the drought. And that's principally working through our most trusted partners, UN and international NGOs, including Concern, who's on this call. Yeah. And thank you so much, Ambassador. And you know, just to say, we're also uh, we're also very proud to have um, to have, have a woman like yourself leading the response and leading the embassy. And I know that there are a number of um, of really strong and and powerful women ambassadors across the region um, serving as ambassadors to um, to different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Edwin, perhaps coming to yourself, um, I know just listening to uh, to the ambassador describing the the different programs and the portfolios um, concern worldwide working in um, in Kenya. I know you have a focus on um, climate change particularly and we, we're very interested just to know a little bit about how the, the programs and the projects that you're working on, um, you know, really uh, h- how climate change affects the health challenges and what interventions or strategies are currently being uh, being employed. Yeah, yes, thank you so much. Uh, um, you know, just to add on uh, uh, Ambassador Fimula's point on uh, the, the the impact of uh, climate change on the overall health system 
is uh, and just to dive into the issues of food insecurity, uh, we have seen over the last couple of years increased uh, cases of uh, uh, children with acute malnutrition. For example, uh, we did a projection of the country earlier in the year uh, and uh, estimating that about 970,000 children uh, uh, under five are in need uh, for treatment uh, for acute malnutrition. And uh, if you look at some of the nutrition surveillances, you will note that the global acute malnutrition rate is uh, up to about 30%, meaning that one in every three children uh, uh, is having acute malnutrition and requires treatment for it, especially in some of these uh, vulnerable counties like Trukana County, Mandera County, uh, Mazabit County. Actually, we, we did highlight some of these issues in uh, the 2022 Global Hunger Index Report, uh, where Kenya is ranked 94th out of uh, 136 uh, and having uh, a hunger score of 23.5%, uh, uh, which categorizes Kenya as uh, uh, being at a serious level in terms of hunger. Uh, other issues that uh, you know are affected by climate change in include uh, displacement as a result of flooding. We are seeing uh, you know increased flooding, as, especially around the major rivers, in Tana River. You know some reports estimate that about seventy five thousand. Uh, people will be at risk of different flooding by 2030. Uh, if you look at uh, the infectious uh, disease patterns, we are seeing increasing uh, vector-borne diseases like malaria, uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, communicable diseases uh, due to displacement. Uh, we are just uh, grappling with a cholera uh, outbreak uh, among uh, several vulnerable counties. Uh, in the country. And, you know, to be honest, uh, uh, Kenya's health system is uh, ability to adopt to the climate change and the, st the stresses and the burden of additional morbidity, uh, you know, is, is very low. And therefore, well, as Gonsan, uh, we, are, we are really uh, supporting uh, quite a number of programs. Uh, we are we are happy to be recipients of uh, Irish Aid funding uh, in the region, uh, and uh, you know while uh, this funding is is really uh, targeting uh, other countries in the region, uh, we are still having a number of programs uh, that you know are responding uh, to the you know the the climate change uh, issue in the region. Uh, for example, you know in. Um, uh, we are implementing responsive and inclusive drought uh, response actions in several counties uh, where we are targeting to improve access to health and nutritional services uh, through regular uh, integrated outreaches. Uh, we, we are uh, targeting uh, for reduced mobility uh, by ensuring that uh, communities that are vulnerable and marginalized uh, parts of our counties, uh, Massabit, Trokana, Isioro, Tanariba, have access uh, to treatment of uh, uh, you know, nutrition and nutrition-related uh, illnesses. We are also implementing uh, climate smart agriculture in a number of counties, for example, in Tanariba and Trokana County, we've been able to transform the lives of over 10,000 farmers uh, who were previously practicing pastoralism alone. And we, you know, by supporting them to uh, practice irrigation uh, fed agriculture along, along the, the major rivers, that is uh, River Tana River and um, uh, uh, Takwell in Chukana, uh, we, we do note that there is improved productivity. Uh, they are able to grow nutritious foods, they are able to feel the, feed their children, and they are able to make surplus that they can be able to generate some income. And, you know, f from the various nutrition uh, services that we undertake, we note that the rate of malnutrition among children in these particular communities has uh, reduced quite significantly. In Tana River, we are implementing uh, flood resilience programming. We are, we are working with counties uh, and communities to identify as uh, the key risks uh, around flooding are uh, predicting uh, the, the impact and the expanse of uh, the flooding and, you know, to put in place mitigative measures uh, to counter uh, the, 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 you know, the devastating uh, effects of uh, uh, flooding. Uh, so I think those are some of the few programs that we are implementing to address 
uh, the impact of uh, climate change on our health system. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. And you know, again, just just a very there's just so many issues that um, that 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 need to be tackled. And I'm just wondering if um, just just kind of moving on from from what um, Ambassador Quinlan was mentioning around just the vulnerability of women and, and young girls. And um, what can you say um, about some of the programs that you're working in, in particular in relation to the climate change pro, uh, the climate change interventions? What are you seeing in terms of the risks and vulnerabilities for women and young girls, but also the opportunities and the resilience? Yes, absolutely. Climate change has really uh, sort of um, magnified the vulnerability, especially among uh, our vulnerable populations, among women. I think Ambassador uh, Fignola did mention about issues around loss of livestock, loss of assets, uh, leading to a lot of pressure in the household and leading to increased uh, gender-based violence. Uh, there's loss of income and therefore once the socioeconomic status of the household deteriorates, the first cohort to really uh, suffer from the vulgarities of this are the women and the children. And so we note that, you know, there is increasing uh, gender-based violence. Uh, some reports have indicated that, you know, there is increasing incidences of mental health issues uh, as a result of the, you know, the, 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 the burden of, uh, you know, climate change, uh, especially the household and community level. We do note, uh, for example, because of the drought, uh, women are forced to trek further to, 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 to search for uh, water, trek further to search for firewood, trek further to search for, you know, for, you know, what they need uh, to support the, the households. And, you know, this kind of high workload then uh, un undermines the ability to, pro to, to protect and take care of their children. And child care practices have really suffered uh, because of uh, the impact of uh, climate change. And of course, the, the, this uh, presents uh, uh, huge opportunities uh, because, uh, you know, uh, there is a need to uh, increase knowledge and awareness of the impacts of climate change uh, at the community level, at the household level, and, you know, to ensure that communities uh, are aware and, you know, start to implement key actions that enable them to be more resilient to the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, scaling up uh, climate uh, smart programming, especially around product, uh, uh, food uh, production systems. As I've mentioned that, you know, we have empowered, you know, uh, farmers uh, in Tana River, in Trokana County uh, to practice climate smart agriculture through uh, irrigation-fed uh, agriculture. And a majority of these are women. And therefore, by ensuring that these communities are more productive, we're able to see more and more women uh, being able to have access to healthy foods for their children, for themselves, for their households, and of, of course, to reduce uh, the kind of uh, burden of having to uh, you know, fend for their families uh, in the absence of uh, these uh, particular resources. And of course, other opportunities include, you know, there's a global um, reaction to the impact of climate change and there's uh, availability of climate and health specific uh, uh, financing that, you know, we must advocate for and clamor for uh, so that we can be able to then invest these resources uh, to build inclusive and responsive uh, food systems uh, for our communities uh, in the, you know, the arid and semi arid lands where these uh, particular individuals are most affected. And then most importantly, we have the one health approach. The one health approach uh, is an approach, you know, that has been there since 2010, uh, that aims to address issues around the interactions between human health, environmental health, and animal health, and to mitigate against the risk of increasing zoonotic diseases. I dare say that uh, COVID-19 is you know, some uh, experts who term it as a zoonotic disease that COVID-19 did, you know, uh, create uh, the need to scale up uh, the One Health approach. So these are some of the, the key opportunities we have that we can implement to mitigate against the impact of climate change on health. Thank you.
Thank you, Edwin. Um, very well said. Um, I'm wondering, um, Samson, from your perspective um, with International Alert and some of the uh, the programming that you're involved in, could you say a little bit around, you know, climate se- climate security challenges and how that is impacting on service delivery from different sectors, including the health sector? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nadine. Um, so I think for climate, I um, mean, International Alert and climate security. We are looking at how cause the effects of climate or rather the impacts of climate change uh, continue to compound existing you know, structural inequalities that have been there um, the longest time and how then that looks like uh, amongst the major members. So looking at how, for instance, conflict uh, in the North Rift um, affects delivery of health services or any other services for that matter, um, you'd find that uh, more often, uh, or for the most part, you are being the state focusing on uh, security, um, investing more in security, uh, to deal with the insecurity, as opposed to looking at more sustainable uh, ways of uh, training peace in the region. And I think one of those would be investment in health, infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure, socially or rather physical infrastructure, uh, also looking at how to bring on board uh, more personnel to undertake health interventions, but also uh, looking at how you can, I mean, the state can essentially invest more in processes uh, such as uh, Healthcare, or rather interventions for on malnutrition as well as medical diseases, as Mr. Edwin has put it. But um, in terms of uh, how climate, uh, I mean, climate uh, security is impacting on uh, issues of health, I would say one of the biggest issues, of course, how it is impeding the delivery of those very uh, much needed interventions at the grassroots level. And so the much, I mean, the most vulnerable. So, Groups in the community are not getting that very needed help they need. Uh, you but women look at children, just as I think Edwin has put it. Women and children are most at risk. And so, for the most part, the extent of fragility uh, puts them in a very tight position in terms of being able to access uh, much needed healthcare apps, uh, looking at uh, interventions on malnutrition or reproductive health, I think. Uh, that is the biggest challenge. So while I would say the state of insecurity itself impedes that service delivery because uh, people are not able to get that much needed help or intervention uh, because essentially people cannot go in a fragile context uh, because of insecurity. So you'd find most areas lacking those critical interventions. But beyond that, um, most of You'd find, for instance, structures like a health center uh, abandoned because of security. And so uh, I think that is an issue also. So essentially, the state of insecurity prevents that critical service delivery. But also, more often than not, the state is forced to invest more, like what is happening now and not in hard security approaches. Uh, at, the, at the experts of perhaps um, healthcare or, or other critical services that are required. And so challenges attributed to healthcare or nutrition persist because of limited funding, uh, funding to programs to address healthcare, but also to uh, recruit personnel to actually uh, manage those uh, facilities and also provide the necessary equipment to actually ensure that the facilities are running. So whether it's actual healthcare facilities or associated programs uh, attributed to uh, I mean, managing issues of nutrition or sexual health and production and all that. So I think that is the biggest challenge, I would say, uh, in relation to conflict. Thank you, Samson. And, and I just wonder, um, based on your experience, what you've seen and also your vision for, for, for what, what you could see, how best can communities engage on climate action, um, particularly as a way of attaining, as I heard you say, sustainable peace? Um, yeah. What would you say? What, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think the biggest challenge right now, and um, of course, uh, at the global level, we have conversations around climate finance and 
how the United Nations need to actually take more responsibility to provide necessary financing for developing countries such as Kenya to effectively address uh, climate-related risks impacts. But I think for us, we are looking at how, uh, one, uh, the governance in itself, the governance of climate finance, like how it would actually help solve some of those structural inequalities that already exist. So looking at how communities can effectively participate in the planning or rather decision-making processes and implementation of climate-related uh, interventions, such as mitigation and repression, to actually address long-standing challenges attributed to uh, sustainable growth, development, poverty eradication, and all that, but also looking critically at conflict, because again, conflict is, is a wide subject posed by many issues. Uh, the drivers of conflict are quite diverse, uh, and amongst them, of course, those social and economic uh, challenges that exist. And so perhaps we are looking at how to bring communities together to strengthen uh, governance structures at the community level, but also at uh, policy making level to actually address uh, climate change or rather look at climate change as an working problem. Uh, looking at the context uh, where we work, we work in West Port, we also work in Chicago counties. And beyond that, the other counties uh, such as Baringo, uh, such as Saburu, that face similar challenges. Uh, and then looking at what, uh, I mean, main economic mainstay in the region being pastoralism and how essentially climate change is causing a great risk the I mean, it's learning security is there. And so trying to frame climate change as the enemy, essentially, and not mm. communities themselves. And so looking at what is existing in terms of uh, programs or processes by the government, the national government, as well as the regional governments here in Kenya, to address climate action, or rather to address the effects of climate change. And so the rallying communities uh, speak in one voice uh, in terms of addressing the effects of climate change, peace. Mm -hmm. So essentially addressing climate, I mean, uh, engagements rather, whether it's around planning, whether it's around implementing interventions aim at climate change adaptation or mitigation, uh, but then with a focus on uh, strengthening community cohesion. So, because we believe if communities are able to focus on climate change, which for the longest time has continued to compound uh, existing socioeconomic challenges, then perhaps communities can find a reason, reason together, a point of a common reasoning. And so, in a way, gradually trying to bring them together to speak uh, towards uh, those common uh, approaches for addressing climate change. Yeah, and so hopefully we can actually look at uh, state where communities are actually focusing more on climate change vis-a-vis -vis other issues that time to time, of course, should be that mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, yeah. of course, the context is uh, is fluid, and there are many issues that drive yes. the conflict. Yeah. Yes. Well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samson. And I guess I'm. I'm also wondering um, if if you have listeners to this uh, to this podcast who will be in Ireland, probably very you know passionate global health advocates and others who are just so interested in the sustainable development goals. Um, do you have one key message for them? Well, uh, I would say because uh, I would say for Ireland as a developed nation and as a key partner, uh, rather development uh, assistant partner for the country. Uh, I would say we would need more action, essentially at global level, in terms of climate financial commitments, because of course uh, there has been a lot of talk about developed nations not doing much actually, mm -hmm. in terms of, or rather too much talk and like less action, I would say, mm -hmm. something of the sort. So I think, and that is what will frame up conversions at, at 48, but in September we have the Climate Action Summit in Nairobi. And we are actually planning to have a both or rather a side session to actually speak about some of these challenges, speak about issues of conflict, uh, climate security, and uh, lobby essentially for greater financing uh, around uh, for developing nations such as Kenya to actually effectively address climate-related challenges. Excellent. So that is what I would say. Yeah. Okay. 
good well heard we hear you um and thank you for that um thank you for for being just you know just so clear about what's needed and why and um, edwin coming to you i guess a similar question i, I mean a, a, a two-sided question i mean what key message or call to action do you have for um for for people listening to this people who would like to help would like to be involved you know what is your what's your key advice or message well, well thank you very much i i think um just borrowing from uh, Ambassador Fimula's, uh, uh, you know, inputs on the better, uh, a better world policy where Ireland has outlined its key agenda uh, to address issues, including issues in health and climate change, uh, you know, increase funding uh, for women, economic empowerment, uh, in, 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 in intensify the effort we have around protecting women, uh, you know, uh, and creating a, you know, sustainable peace, uh, uh, as some, some sort of mentioned, and of course, being ready to, uh, rapidly respond to the humanitarian, uh, crisis, uh, as, uh, has been the case, uh, for developing nations such as ourselves, uh, you know, to ensure that, uh, you know, we do not have uh, casualties as a result of uh, climate change. And importantly, I know we have entrepreneurs, we have innovators, we have big manufacturers who can invest in, you know, sustainable food systems, make, you know, make uh, climate change uh, and um, health as well as food and nutrition uh, security business. Uh, we have a project in the urban informal settlements where we are working with uh, private manufacturers to increase access to, you know, healthy foods. And, you know, uh, they have uh, taken on uh, uh, orange fresh sweet potato uh, value chain, which is a drought resistant, fast growing uh, food crop, you know, and they're, yeah, they're making money uh, by ensuring that uh, communities are accessing healthy uh, affordable, nutritious foods. And therefore, I would add that, you know, every every citizen should uh, explore whatever role they can play in terms of mitigating against the, the impacts on climate change, uh, of climate change on health, and especially on the issue around uh, food insecurity. Thank mm. you. Thank you, Edwin. That's good food for thought to uh, to go in there. Um, and Ambassador Quinlan, um, maybe just just coming back to you as we end our time um, in this particular episode. Um, if you'd like to comment on anything that you've heard, and also just from you, um, you know, in the position that you have there, what what would be your key message or call to action for for people who are listening and would like to be involved, would like to be supportive? Um, what would you say to them? Well, first, maybe just to, to thank Edwin and Samson for their very uh, compelling inputs. And I think when we think about what is, what what can make a difference, if we were to say what one thing could make a difference, and of course, we know one thing isn't the solution to anything, but I think just listening to them as well brings it home, you know, the importance of gender really and gender equality as a central factor in, cha- in tackling many of the challenges that we face as a global community. I mean, they've spoken very passionately about, you know, how the burden of climate change, of drought, of insecurity, of conflict falls disproportionately on women, whether that's around their access to nutrition and healthcare and so forth, or their risk of gender-based violence um, and, you know, ac- of mental health issues and access to services and so forth. So I suppose I would always you know, remind people that the, you know, it's a, it's a journey where we're on ourselves in Ireland and many countries are, right? None of us have nailed the gender equality issue yet. But I think um, particularly in the developing world, you know, trying to work to empower women and ensure that they there is more gender equality really will will make a difference. And of course, you know, information and data is also very important. Um, so further research on the on the intersection between health gender and climate change would really help us, I think, and help to inform interventions. And I just finally, if you will allow me another moment, just to pick up on something Samson said, because I'd, I'd meant to mention it, and I think it's really important, this issue of the climate change conference that Nairobi is hosting in September. And they're hosting it with, along with the African Union, you know, inviting leaders from across the continent and also um, from around the world. But really, 
it's designed, you know, the conference is designed to catalyze action and solutions for climate change in Africa um, and really push for increased investment in climate action. But also I think there's a strong sense that Africa has a huge amount to offer in terms of solutions. You know, it, the, you know, we had a briefing just this morning and they were talking about, you know, Africa has enormous manpower or women power and huge resources. So it's around trying to bring those resources and, and opportunities together with people who can invest in a really green and sustainable way in a very equitable way. So I think it's just another example of where Kenya is showing huge leadership on these issues. Um, and along with, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, there are real massive gains in terms of um, sustainable energy and, and having over 90% renewables. But yeah, that's, that's, I think, uh, gender equality is where I would stake my, um, it's where I'd stake my, my clicking. Thank <laughs> you very much, Nadine and colleagues. Well, thank you so much. And we, we really, really look forward to seeing the leadership of Kenya and Ireland in the conference coming up in September. That'll be September 2023 in, uh, in Nairobi. We look forward to that. We'll be following that. And thank you all for, for together painting a, a picture that's really understandable in terms of the intersections of health, gender and climate change, something that we're all very keen to understand as best we can and, and just to be able to support ourselves and the organizations that we're working with to be able to respond as as appropriately and as effectively as possible. So very grateful to all three of you. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of another enlightening episode of Better Health for a Better World. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of the remarkable global health projects and programs supported by the government of Ireland. Remember, by investing in the health and well-being of communities around the globe, we not only create a better world for those in need, but also foster a more interconnected and compassionate planet. We encourage you to stay engaged and to take action, as each of us has the power to make a difference. Thank you for joining us on this journey towards better health for a better world.